This is One on One. This state has a whole range of extraordinary performers, musicians, artists, and uh, we are honored to have one of them right here in Newark at NJPAC. He is um, E Street's Max Weinberg, and uh, people have been loving you and your work for a long time, and uh, your jersey's on, and we're proud to have you, Max. Thank you. It's good to be back in my uh, hometown of Newark, New Jersey. Talk about the hometown part. Well, I was born in Newark at Beth Israel Hospital, April of 1951. My musical roots uh, literally sprung from blocks around where we're sitting right now. Back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, New York, uh, Newark had an incredibly vibrant uh, musical uh, scene. It still does in so many ways, but there were clubs, there were teen clubs, there were theaters. Uh, one of my greatest memories was seeing James Brown mm. at the old RKO Theater uh, in 1964. So we would uh, go over there and there were so many opportunities both to play at the various Y's, the, the Jewish Y on Chancellor Avenue. And, wow. uh, all my shopping was done in Newark, so it's wonderful to be sitting here with you again today. Legend has it, or it's a fact, that um, you started playing drums at a very young age. How, how old? Well, I was about five years old when I started the uh, just banging around on a little old drum that my cousin gave me. My first inspiration was seeing Elvis Presley, but it wasn't on the Ed Sullivan Show. It was six months earlier on the Milton Berle Show. And what grabbed me that particular night, sitting there with my two teenage sisters on the floor in front of this you know, little black and white TV right. set, was the drummer, DJ Fontana who is alive and well, living in Nashville, Tennessee, and was Elvis's drummer from 54 to 68. And he had that big drum roll in Hound Dog. And I heard that, and for me, uh, that was a call to arms. Uh, mm. And I was about, just about five years old. But in 1974, it's not a fact that you answer an ad, I believe in the Village Voice. This is a fact. In 1974, you answer an ad, um, the E Street Band, I believe, were they called the E Street Band? Yeah, it was uh, an ad that was put in the Village Voice. It said, wanted drummer, <laughs> no junior Ginger Bakers. Now, Ginger Baker was, of course, the incredibly talented, flamboyant drummer for Cream. And what that said to me in mm. this ad, apart from the fact that it said, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, Columbia Records, which indicated that well, they had a record deal, they were doing better than I was, what the reference to Ginger Baker indicated was that Bruce and the band were looking for an accompanist, not a soloist, and that's, that's what I did. That was the best thing I did, was play drums the way I play them, but play them the way you want to hear them. First time you meet, <clears throat> excuse me, in that audition, if you will. By the way, in the audition, do you meet Bruce? Oh, sure. Describe it. Well, it was wonderful. You know, it was an open audition. Everybody got to play a half hour, all the drummers. I think I was something like 56 out of 60-something drummers. That many? Yeah, there were a lot of drummers. Everybody about. wanted the gig? Well, I would say that anybody who got the opportunity to play okay. with Bruce and E Street Band after they played wanted the gig. Okay. Now, this was uh, nearly 40 years ago, yes. so the band uh, wasn't as well-known, obviously, kind of a cult following. Bruce had had two albums out on uh, Columbia Records. Uh, had Greetings? Had, greetings from Asbury Park. Was out already? And The Wild, The Innocent, and The East Street Got Shuffle, uh, both of which I didn't play on. And as a matter of fact, the first album I played on, and the first commercially successful record I ever played on, though it was not the first, was Born to Run. However, a lot of people think I played on the song Born to Run. Uh, that was not me. That was a good friend of mine, Boom Carter, who, whose lasting legacy with Bruce Springsteen is he played on that one song, Born to Run. But in the uh, uh, audition, which was August of 74, everybody who auditioned got to play a half hour, no matter how good or how bad you were. Mm. And uh, I can remember I was playing in the Broadway show Godspell uh, up on 76th Street at the Promenade Theater. And it was a Monday night. It was a dark night. I didn't want to bring an entire drum set. So I brought a bass drum, a snare drum, and the cymbals that go up and down, a hi-hat. So I wasn't trying to make any minimalist statement it was just that it was, more uh, it was more convenient to just bring a small little drum set, and that made quite an impression. Uh, in one of the first songs we played, uh, and I never knew quite why he chose me, many, many years later, 25 years later, we 
we're in California, and I asked him, Bruce, why did you choose me? What made the band decide I was the guy? He said, well, we, I did this thing with everybody. And if you know, uh, if you've seen us play in concert, Bruce does a lot of incredible physical stuff on stage. And at one point in this one song, he went like this, like stop. And if you didn't stop, you were automatically eliminated. You're out. You're out, because you weren't paying attention. Then there was a long pause, and he did this for every drummer. He suddenly threw his arm out like that. And because I'd had a lot of experience playing behind dancers and singers and drums in service of something else, not just my own uh, desire to show off, when he threw his arm out, I hit a, Is that snare a rim shot? shot. It was a big rim shot. You knew instinctively? To hit, yeah. When, well, when a dancer kicks, you hit a cymbal. You know, a comic, I had a lot of experience playing behind But he didn't say anything to you. No, totally Nothing. instinctive. And the fact that I went for it, that's how I got to join the E Street Band. And you didn't know that for 25 years after? And I never asked. I never <laughs> thought about it. It was very natural to me to re respond to the physical movement. And as we started to play bigger venues, and he put the guitar down and became the front man that he is today, that physicality in the drumming uh, was used to sort of further that stage business, so to speak. Max, when did you know that the E Street Band, that you and Bruce and Clarence Clemens and, and together, what you guys had, when did you know that it was just something extraordinary? I knew instantly, as soon as I did that audition. At that point, I was 23. I'd been playing since I was about five, all around Essex County, everywhere I could, you know, and I did cruise ships, weddings, bar mitzvahs, you name it. Trying to find work. Just uh, keeping busy as a working drummer as I went through school, Columbia High School in Maplewood, New Jersey. And when I, when Bruce counted it off, and it was all business, when he got to four, I could tell, not so much from what he did, but from the way Clarence Clemens, Gary Talent, and Danny Federici, uh, my beloved bandmates, uh, re related to Bruce. And I, that's something I'd never experienced, that kind of focus, that kind of intensity and discipline. And it was immediately apparent. And then, of course, we played, I remember that everybody got a half hour, but that first night uh, we played for three hours. So I went away feeling pretty good about that. Then I got very nervous. I went back for a second audition a week later because now I really wanted this gig. And two days later I got in the band in uh, August of 1974, coming up on 40 years. Wow. But in 1989... You guys, something happens. Yeah, 1989, we essentially broke up. And, uh, Why? Well, I think it was time to fly the nest. And now with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, it was the best thing that ever happened to all of us. Best? It was the best thing well, that you ever happened. Well, you continued to do great things, but why at the time was it? Well, it was disturbing at the time because all, in my own case, speaking for myself, it was... Once I got in the E Street Band, that was all I did for 15 years. I played on some other records, uh, uh, Meat Loaf's Bat Out of Hell, Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse of the Heart. I did That's some you. session work. Yeah, that was me. Okay. And, uh, but the E Street Band was uh, the focus of, of all my professional activity, of course. And when you're doing the E Street Band, it is the focus of your professional activity. So it was, at the time, I was... Uh, uh, 40, thereabouts, no, it was 39, I guess, and it was disturbing because if you were standing, it was like standing on a, <laughs> on a floor that suddenly gave way, and as I say, it was the best thing that ever happened because you get kicked out of the nest, you learn to fly, That's you right. have no choice, and uh, I went into the record business in New Jersey, I did a lot of different things that I hadn't done uh, prior to the band, quote unquote, breaking up. As it turns out, it was never in Bruce's mind that we break up. He just wanted to explore other avenues for his music. He likens it to mining in a vein in the ground. And you take this vein and you work that one for a while and then you take another one. And you know, we had had the uh, 10 to 12 years of constant touring, constant recording, culminating with the Born in the USA tour in 84, 85. And that was our own version of, it doesn't get any better than this. Take a break. Well, it was a break. It, was a, it, was a, it turned out to be an 11-year break. Talk about the, um, being the band leader, head of the band, and also musical director for Conan, right? For the late night program on NBC, that was a lot of fun. Big, that was tr tremendous, right? Well, that's a big stage. 
you know, network TV is a big stage. I'd never done anything like that. I had a wonderful group of musicians. They came after you. No, actually, what happened was... Uh, I heard uh, they came after you. Well, they didn't come after me, actually. Uh, I was looking for a way back in. I started, uh, as I said earlier, after the band broke up, I did a lot of different things. I went into business, but I felt my drumming ability slipping away. So that was 89. When does the late night thing happen? Late night happened in 93. Okay. Long story short, my wife and I were having dinner in New York, taking a walk down 7th Avenue. We get to the corner of 54th Street. Standing on the corner is Conan O'Brien. I said to my wife, Becky, <laughs> that's Conan O'Brien. She said, great, who's Conan O'Brien? <laughs> and I explained that. He was the guy that was taking over for David Letterman on yeah. the late night program. And I'd seen him on Tom Snyder's old right. uh, cable show. And I recognized him. And she said, well, why don't you, my wife encouraged me to go over and say hello. So he was waiting for the light to turn. He's a six foot five redheaded yep. guy. And I went on to, to talk to him and I, there I am pitching him on the corner. And about, now I had no band, but I had a great idea for a band and I had a lot of management experience working in the record business. Sure. Uh, and also being a guy who, you know, spoke softly, listened and carried a big drum stick. And you're from Jersey. Speaking management band. helps from being from Jersey. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> okay. It does. And uh, uh, one thing led to another and uh, I put that band together and it was a wonderful experience. Did that for 17 years. Yeah. 16 in New York, about 10 months uh, in the short-lived uh, Tonight Show, and uh, I it was heard a wonderful about that. experience. You heard about that? <laughs> Great experience. The whole yeah. thing. One of the greatest parts about it was flying on my own, so to speak, as a musician, but yeah. also being able to be home every night wow. and fulfilling my favorite role, which is uh, the father of two wonderful children. So instead of go, excuse me, instead of going on the road, I was That's able great. to to have a normal sort of nine to five job, except it was 11 to nine. I'm gonna, before I let you out of here, I'm gonna give you a chance to talk about um, Hurricane Sandy has affected so many people and um, Governor Christie actually sat in that chair not too long ago. A while back we did uh, a conversation with Governor Christie at NJ Pack, and we talked a lot about Sandy and I know you have a good relationship with the governor. Um, I do, I um, do. But the, Sandy impacted a lot of people, impacted you, in, 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 impacted the folks around you, your community. Talk about the situation going on down there and why it's so important to you. Well, the devastation that Sandy brought to uh, so many areas, particularly the Jersey Shore, is just incredible. Uh, I, I took a tour three days later and it was just shocking. In my own neck of the woods, um, we live in Atlantic Highlands on Sandy Hook Bay. And we had a 16 and a half uh, foot storm surge. The stories that you hear are so much more devastating than anything that happened to anybody uh, in that town. There was some, there was some damage, um, but when you go down to Maniloking, uh, Belmar, Seager, I mean, you just can't believe it. In Atlantic Highlands, though, in the marina, there must have been 200 boats piled on top of each other. It looked like mm. Godzilla picked them up and just stomped on them. The whole marina was wiped out. And in connection with that, we have an interesting uh, geological feature down there, the hills of Atlantic Highlands, which are built on slump blocks, which are very, very sensitive areas. And one of the features, which we're all in favor of, and it's a wonderful uh, public access route, is what's known as the Bayshore Trail. It's part of the National Rail to Trail program that unused railroad beds were turned into hiking trails. But it was hit by Sandy, devastated, but something has to be done right now, which is? Yeah, this is what needs to be done. Uh, those of us who love the trail, and there has been some lack of full disclosure in some of the media reports that I've seen, where, you know, facts, if you withhold the actual facts, you get a distorted uh, story. Uh, this is a wonderful access way to actually walk along the water, and no one ever said, that uh, uh, the trail should be abandoned, but it must be restored in a sustainable, ecologically friendly way. That if means, not? Well, what's gonna happen is you're at the toe of the slope. It washed away the bluff. In New Jersey, under the coastal regulations, a bluff is the same as a sand dune. You don't wanna take a bulldozer on it. You don't wanna drill into it. You don't want to remove native vegetation. This was all done somewhat in the name of progress through the years. And 
it weakened the bluff, which got liquefied during Sandy and then sucked out to, to the ocean. So what you have now is a cliff, and it's very dangerous. Mm. This is a cliff that is owned by um, a county uh, organiz uh, county department, the Parks Department, and it's a sheer cliff with rock and, and, and veg some vegetative matter that presents both a liability to the public and a real danger to the homes that line this. Something's got to be done. Max, I want to thank you uh, for not just talking about your extraordinary career so far. Uh, the E Street story and Bruce and Clarence and terrific people. We always will miss Clarence, as you guys do in a special way, but also mm -hmm. sharing these important concerns uh, going on, ecological and otherwise, uh, down at the Jersey Shore. Max, you, you honor us by your presence here. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, Steve. Appreciate it. It's always good to watch you and now to be talking with you here. It's better the other way around. Stay with us. We'll be right back from uh, NJ Pack right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, in cooperation with NJTV and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One at NJ Pack with Steve Adubato has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, Barnabas Health, TD Bank. Verizon Communications, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Josh S. Weston, and by NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.